Good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, good morning, perhaps, depending on your time zone. I am Dania Daffer, the Executive Director at Gulf International Forum. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this discussion today. It is our distinct uh, privilege and honor uh, to have General Joseph Votel for a conversation on the future of the U.S. presence in the Gulf region. Um, some housekeeping notes before beginning. Um, if anyone has any questions, please uh, post them early on. Um, just to briefly outline the event today, uh, Washington has been doing some soul searching on how the U.S. should proceed with regards to its military and strategic presence in the Gulf region and the broader Middle East. Actors in the region are bewildered by the U.S.'s uh, strategic be behavior as I would uh, characterize as neither, uh, uh, as, as typified either, uh, is not typified by having uh, retrenchment or interventionalism. The region has been historically touted to be intrinsically linked to U.S. security interests um, issues such as non-proliferation, counterterrorism cooperation, the integration of energy into the global markets were at the top of the list. Is that still the case? How is the U.S.'s role in the region evolving? Today, we are fortunate to have uh, General Voto to disentangle the elusive quest of security in the Gulf and the U.S.'s role in that quest. General Joseph Votel retired from the U.S. Army after concluding a 39-year career capped by serving as the commander of the U.S. Central Command responsible for an area encompassing the Middle East, Levant, and Central and South Asia. General Votel's career saw him commanding special operations and conventional forces at many levels. He saw combat in Panama, Afghanistan, and Iraq. He led a 79 country coalition uh, that successfully liberated Iraq and Syria from ISIS. Prior to his assignment at CENTCOM, General Votel served as the commander of the US Special Operations Command and the Joint Special Operations Command. General Votel has received many uh, military and civilian decorations, not least the Army's Legion of Merit and Bronze Star, the Distinguished Military Leadership Award from the Atlantic Council, the Distinguished Service Award from the National Medal of Honor Society, not counting other numerous, uh, uh, that we could, other numerous awards that we could mention here. General Votel uh, currently serves as president and CEO of the Business Executives for National Security. He's a non-resident distinguished fellow at the Middle East Institute and the Belfer Center at Harvard University. He is also an advisor to the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. He is a 1980 graduate of the United States Military Academy and earned a master's degree from the U.S. Army Command and Staff College and the Army War College. Thank you uh, for your honor, honorable service to our country. General Votel, welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel. It's great, to, it's great to be with you and with our audience today. Thank you. We're, we're very honored to have you. So I will start, uh, if you don't mind, with uh, a broad question. Uh, the Gulf states are ap apprehensive about whether the U.S. may reduce its strong strategic presence in the Gulf region. Is the U.S.'s strategic calculus that that it may the main security guarantor is the U.S.'s uh, strategic calculus that made it the the main security guarantor in the Gulf still valid? If so, how? Where does the Gulf region fit in America's grand strategy? Well, thanks. I think that's a, that's a great place to start. And so my answer to your question is yes, I, I, I do think it is a, 
uh, the U.S. is, uh, you know, it's still in our calculus with that. Uh, but I think as we move forward, it may be changing form uh, in terms of how we, uh, how we, how we actually orchestrate that. So, you know, I think any any discussion of this area, any discussion of any particular area, always, always has to start with a understanding of what our interests are. And uh, in, in your comments, you touched on a couple of a uh, couple of interests that 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 exist today. You know, uh, protecting the homeland uh, and our allies and partners from uh, the effects of terrorist organizations that uh, find a home in this particular region, and uh, certainly the freedom of commerce uh, through the waterways and uh, land routes of the Middle East and Central and South Asia and the Levant here that. Uh, that not only support U.S. Uh, interests but support the uh, support uh, you know the interests of our of our good allies and friends. We're certainly not as dependent upon uh, Middle East oil and gas as we as we once were, and we've actually uh, this is an uh, this is an issue that the United States has largely addressed for itself, uh, frankly. But again, many of our partners are, and there are other things that move through there. It's I think it's important to understand that uh, on a day to day basis, uh, 25 to 40 percent of the world's uh, commerce moves through the waterways of this of this particular region. So in in any in any regard, this is uh, this is an important interest here. And of course, we're we've got to be concerned about the instability in this area, uh, flowing out and affecting other things. And everybody can remember the pictures of refugees fleeing from Syria and the heartbreaking images that created the problems it created in Europe and our own country with immigration policy. Uh, and so we want to, it's in our interest to prevent that. Um, and of course, uh, preventing proliferation. This is an area where there are the presence of weapons of mass destruction that remains in our in our interest, and uh, you know, and and having a favorable balance of power that was favorable to the United States has long served our our national interest and our approach. So, yes, I do think some of the, those things still still exist, but I do think that uh, we'll we will be looking at the at the form of it. Um, right now, if you look at the national defense strategy of the United States, it puts a premium on great power competition. Um, and someone looking at that could reach the conclusion, well, that means everything is going to Asia or everything's going to Europe. That's, that's not necessarily true. This area, the Middle East, the Levant, Central South Asia, will be an area where we will, where we will compete with other great powers. And so uh, in order to uh, compete, we will have to exert our own influence and do things. So that may take different, uh, different form of, uh, of, uh, of, of presence and activity in the future, maybe perhaps less physical troops on the ground as we wind down these conflicts um, but but hopefully offset with a, with a with a better and more effective combination of diplomacy economic aspects informational ideological aspects and then military aspects so I think the Middle East is going to be an area where we are going to compete uh, for the future and as a result it will continue to be a, a key part of our overall strategy. Is it fair to say that uh, the Gulf uh, region is kind of the linchpin of U.S. Uh, policy uh, towards the Middle East? Well, uh, yeah, I think I think that certainly is that certainly has been true uh, in the past, largely because of some of our dependence upon the resources of that you know particular subregion of the Middle East uh, that has been. But but again, I think as you as you look at this. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia plays an outsized role in the, in not only in the Gulf but in the Middle East, uh, and so we will have to pay it. You know, we have to pay attention to that each of these each of these subregions here, whether it's the Levant, the Gulf area, or Central and South Asia, I think plays plays a. Uh, you know, plays a significant role, uh, but I do think the Gulf will continue to be, uh, you know, kind of a, a preeminent focus for us. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and um, uh, as of I, I have read the national strategy report from when Obama started until Trump uh, took office, and you actually notice slowly that you see the Gulf is less and less mentioned, and you mentioned that great powers are really important. Another thing that was notable is yesterday uh, when we watched uh, the debate, the Middle East was not mentioned, which was surprising for many of us that I guess follow the Middle East. And I guess on everyone's mind is what will 
uh, and what are your expectations for U.S. policy, policy towards the Gulf? Should there be a change of administration other than the withdrawal debate, of course? Well, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really, really good, uh, really good question. And you know, as we were chatting beforehand, uh, I think one of the things that's important for, uh, for us to understand here is to differentiate between ending wars and, <clears throat> and withdrawal of forces. Those are really two different, two different things. I think everybody can agree that we do want to bring these conflicts that we've been involved in uh, for a long time. I mean, uh, Afghanistan is into its uh, 19th year here, uh, coming up on its 20th anniversary next year. This is a very, very long time uh, to be engaged there. These have to come to a conclusion, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that, uh, that, that necessitates the only, it doesn't necessarily mean the only way we can do that is through withdrawal of our own forces. Certainly we wanna reduce our costs, reduce the burdens on the military and the families of military members that are so Associated with that, but I, I, I do think it's a bit, uh, um, it, it's, it's kind of a false approach here to equate um, ending wars and withdrawal. Uh, and we see examples in a variety of other areas where we have ended wars um, by some particular means, uh, you know, look at in Europe and the World War II, yet we retained, uh, you know, U.S. force presence for decades continues to be there today uh, because it is part of our policy. It's part of our overall strategy uh, for security in that part of the world. Um, so uh, I, I think it is important to, to understand that. And, and, you know, and looking at the campaigns, I, I don't have any unique insight into either of them in terms of, uh, in terms of how they may be looking at this. I mean, I think you certainly have heard the, uh, the current administration, the present, administ the present administration, President Trump, talk about a reduction in force and, uh, you know, the, the focus on regional agreements uh, that have you know, most recently been done through the Abraham Accords and things like that. So that, you know, there are definitely uh, ideas that they have and you've uh, probably on the Democratic side heard discussions about concerns about Saudi Arabia and holding them accountable and to some extent, uh, they're doing the same thing with Israel and some of their activities. So I, I'm not sure where all of this will land. My, my, my view here is that I think some of the, some of the principles here will continue to, uh, to continue to apply. Uh, the United States has had a long, uh, a long interest in supporting Israel, uh, and that has driven a lot of our policy towards this particular region. I would expect that that will continue uh, as as we move forward. Um, I, I also think that there will be there will have to be a, a review and ultimately a recognition of what our interests are in 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 this uh, in this region. Um, it, you know, I, I talked about five of them just a few moments ago here, uh, it will be important for our national security architecture to look at those and make an assessment of, about whether those remain valid national security interests. And, and, and if they do, how do we intend to preserve them? I think most importantly uh, is that we will have to figure out how we compete in this region. Um, you know, we have long been the dominant power uh, in uh, in the Middle East, and and I think we largely retain that at this particular point. But there are more and more uh, efforts by China, more and more efforts by Russia. Uh, we see uh, uh, certainly Iran has uh, has interests in this particular area of being a regional hegemon, and and we see Turkey being much more uh, much more active in their pursuit of of their objectives in the region. Uh, and so I think for us. Uh, I think a key part of our strategy going forward will be how do we compete in this area? How do we retain this favorable balance of power that uh, that we have, you know, for for a number of decades now that has generally served our our national interests well over over time. Um, uh, when you look at the whole sweep of time, so I, I think this idea of how we how we learn to compete in this region is going to be really really important. Yes, and uh, you, you brought up some good points, especially about regional actors wanting to play a more hegemonic role in, in the Gulf. Uh, and uh, it's not necessarily just China or, or Russia. Um, and uh, you were talking about there, there's definitely a gray area of how the US could reduce its presence in the Gulf region. Um, and there have been discussions in Washington about 
re retrenchment, uh, reduction of forces, and then there have been extreme discussions, as you mentioned, of uh, withdrawal. Um, and I think it's something that we've heard you discuss before, and I think other generals as well, is uh, the by, with, and through approach. Although it's not an official doctrine, um, could you please elaborate on this approach? Yeah, sure, absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a great discussion point there. So by, with, and through, uh, I think the way that I, you know the audience should think about this is it's kind of an approach to how we partner uh, with people on the ground, uh, with our partners in the region, to uh, you know basically address our U.S. interests, and and maybe maybe a little bit more discussion about the actual approach and what the words mean, I think, is important as well. So the three words by, with, through, and through uh, here with us. So by, of course, means that uh, the actions on the ground are are largely being taken by our partners, by our partners, with. Uh, with our enabling capabilities, uh, assistance, advice, uh, and then through a, a diplomatic and uh, legal arrangement of authorities, permissions, uh, and you know political approaches that are that are that are that uh, kind of guide the overall uh, relationship uh, that we're developing. So you know, by with and through, I think it's a fairly sophisticated uh, concept. It's not particularly new either. I mean, we've always done this before. Four, we've had varying degrees of success with it. Uh, I, 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 I may be a little bit parochial. I, uh, since I was so heavily involved in the, uh, the defeat ISIS campaign in Iraq and Syria, where we did apply by, with, and through, and I think we did well with that, uh, with that approach uh, in both of those areas, working with the Iraqi army in, uh, in, in Iraq and with uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, this combination of of, uh, of Syrian Kurds and Arab militia forces um, uh, on the ground. And, and what we were able to do is we were able to, you know, using the by, with, and through approach, uh, really uh, use an economy of US force and capabilities on the ground uh, and in the air uh, and, and really achieve our objectives. In this case, the, uh, the defeat of the Islamic Caliphate um, the destruction of the of the Islamic physical caliphate here uh, by by a limited presence on the ground uh, and by trying to get partners that uh, that really will own the aftermath of this uh, to to take on the heaviest burden. After all, it is the Iraqis that will own the will own this in the long run, just like it is the is the is the Syrian people that will own this in the north uh, eastern part of the country where we worked with both Kurds and and Arab militias, um, and so I think that's a, that's an important aspect. This is a, it's a it is a very deliberate approach. It means you move at the speed of your partners. Uh, which can sometimes be a little bit frustrating. Uh, they're they're going to have a big say in what is happening, uh, but uh, the in this particular case, in the case of our campaign in in Iraq and Syria, I think it uh, I think we were able to achieve our objectives um, and do it at a cost that uh, uh, that was acceptable uh, to our political authorities uh, and and really to the American people. Um, uh, so that's what the buy with and through is about is about. And I think it's a it's a very very good approach and it's a good model for, I think how we ought to be looking at the at this area in the in the future, um, and it does put a premium on people exercising their own self reliance and their own capabilities, uh, and and uh, in leading the fight. And I think that's an important uh, important component as we move forward. Yes, uh, and then that could be one way in which the U.S. can adjust its uh, presence and relationship. Uh, relationships within uh, the region. Um, you, you talked a lot about Iraq and I know that you have a lot of experience um, there. And the threat to the US and Iraq from local militias has been increasing a little bit lately, um, targeting both the US embassy and military bases, hosting US troops. What options uh, in your opinion does Washington have uh, to protect its troops and diplomats, and how does this, uh, how is the situation in Iraq linked to um, uh, resetting, I guess, U.S. Uh, presence in the region? Yeah, uh, again, another really interesting question here. So, you know, there, there's a variety of things that uh, 
that uh, that we we could do. I'll, I'll just boil them down into two broad approaches. Um, you know, the first approach is that we can take action on our own to protect ourselves, um, and that may be uh, reducing vulnerability uh, in the areas where we do maintain U.S. troops. Um, uh, you know, you've seen that in the past with uh, constructs like the green zone and other things like that, or uh, you know, creating physical separations and making it making it more difficult for uh, would be aggressors to get after uh, U.S. interests on the on the ground in a place like Iraq. That's one way of doing it. We could, you know, you can strike back uh, against those particular uh, organizations, or you can hold those who are sponsoring these organizations at risk. Uh, in, in, in my view, there's, 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 I think my reading, there seems to be strong evidence that at least some of these groups are, are continuing to act at the behest of Iran. Uh, and so holding Iran um, uh, uh, at risk with this, I think is, a, is another potential direct approach to this. So, you know, and, and there are various gradients within all of that that we could do. The, the other approach, and I think the one you see right now uh, being exercised largely through our Secretary of State, um, Secretary Pompeo is, is, is to put the pressure on the government of Iraq to address this. And I, and I, and I and I would agree that this is probably the preferred way of doing it, is to get the Iraq. The Iraqis have asked us to be there. We are there at their request. We've always been there at their request um, and, uh, to assist them with the situation they're dealing with on the ground. And they have a responsibility to ensure that our forces are protected. So it's in their interest to, to do this. And, and I do think the approach of, of, of of putting the pressure on the government of Iraq to uh, protect us uh, better is a is a uh, is 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 also a very valid approach to addressing this. And there may be again, there's gradients within this. There could be ways that we could assist them in this with our capabilities and other things, enabling capabilities. Uh, and we probably are right now. Uh, but you know, ultimately, it boils down to those two things. I think that the last point that I would make to you, uh, Daniel, is that. In, in my view, and this was my view as the CENTCOM commander, and it remains my view today, Iraq is a, Iraq is a linchpin country for us. It is geostrategically important to the United States. It sits at a critical location uh, in the region. Uh, it sits between uh, <clears throat> the Levant and, uh, and, uh, and Iran. Uh, it hits, sits at the head of the Gulf, and it is a uh, strong, capable Arab country with lots of resources and a smart uh, population uh, and uh, who can play a positive role in the region. And so in my view, uh, I think it is important for the United States to have influence and to be seen as a good partner to the Iraqis. I think it serves our interests in the region. A small investment in maintaining that uh, is a great way for us to compete in this region, which really is what our overall uh, our overall approach, I think, is moving towards: uh, maintain our own influence, being seen as a viable, uh, uh, reliable partner. I think are are the are the ends we ought to be uh, moving towards here. You, you mentioned uh, being a reliable uh, partner. Um, so what does that really mean? Uh, for example, can the Iraqis and the Kurds really manage without US combat forces there? Do you think that the US should continue to be active there as it is now? Well, I, you know, I, I think with uh, with respect to the threat that we're dealing with with ISIS in a place like Iraq and uh, and and northern northeastern Syria, certainly we didn't have we didn't have cognizance over the whole the landmass of Syria, the area in which we operated was, um, you know, was a subset of it, one third of it in the north in the northeastern third of the of the of the of the country, but you know, for the most part, the Iraqis and the and the and our Kurdish. Syrian Democratic Force partners are already handling a large part of the residual um, threat. Um, both of them are doing this with some level of assistance from the United States or from the coalition, uh, from coalition partners. We still retain, obviously, large uh, and a number of coalition partners on the ground with us, especially in Iraq. Again, an example of by, with, and through here. Uh, both are in a better military position right now 
than they were in 2013, 2014 when this began. I think it's important to recognize that when we joined forces with the Syrian Kurds and ultimately the SDF, they were literally, their backs were literally against the border. Uh, against the, I mean, they were they were in a very small area in uh, uh, north central uh, Syria, and uh, you know we helped them break out of that. Uh, the the Iraqi army after uh, uh, ISIS went through Mosul and moved on down towards uh, Baghdad was in tatters, uh, and it's largely uh, it's largely been able to rebuild itself with the help of the United States and the coalition partners who joined us there. Uh, but they are in a better position today to uh, preserve their interests. In you know in Iraq, I think it, the Iraqi army in particular, I think it is really important that it continues to be a professional uh, professional force that is free from the political pressures uh, that it has been under in the past. Uh, it, it has competent leaders. It has some good processes. Uh, it is largely apolitical right now. Uh, and when you look back at what caused the collapse of uh, of, uh, of the Iraqi army, it, it, it some of it stemmed to uh, an inability to retain those things. Uh, competent leaders had been replaced with political leaders. Uh, there was less focus on this. It was used more as a political instrument, uh, as opposed uh, to, for the prime minister, as opposed to actually securing the country. And as a result, we all saw what happened over there. So it's really important to do that in the, in the United States and other coalition uh, partners can kind of help maintain that. It's in our, it's, a, it's really in our, in our interest to do this. And the cost is not prohibitive uh, to do that. Um, the Syrian situation with the SDF and the Kurds there is a little bit different. They are, they are, they are not a state actor, so to speak, although they, they, uh, they um, have established, a, 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 you know, certainly a presence and a level of legitimacy in the areas in which they are operating. It'll be a little bit more difficult. They've got to be part of a bigger process and the United States and, and really the other coalition partners should, should be uh, focusing on, on how we, how we actually preserve that long term in, in terms of that. So, um, you know, our objective, I think, is to keep both these partners in a, in a, in a position where they can retain the initiative, uh, where they can act proactively, uh, and, uh, and where they can retain necessary capabilities. Uh, so I, I think as we move forward again in this particular area, I think that's what's, what's going to be important for us. <clears throat> Thank you for that a very comprehensive overview. Um, so I'm going to pivot right next door to Iraq uh, and uh, talk about the GCC. They have had a more active role than they have historically or a more assertive role than they have historically to be more correct. Um, do you believe that the GCC members and other countries can reach a, su a sufficient uh, political consensus to create a viable strategic alliance? And how do you envision a framework of such an alliance uh, uh, to work? And you, you talk about by, with, and through. How does the division within the GCC, do you think, how does it affect uh, such an alliance? And do you think that it, it does have any negative effects on US interests in the region? Well, to, to answer your question directly, I think some of the some of the dysfunction with this does have an impact on the United States. But let me let me let me address it a little more fulsomely here. I think it's important for everyone to recognize that you know building coalitions, uh, building alliances is really hard business. It's not done easily. Um, uh, you know, uh, the NATO alliance built over the course of many decades, uh, countries that were naturally aligned there um, is, is certainly, I think, represents the high end of, uh, of coalition building and achievement, uh, and, but not everybody is able to get to that particular level uh, with the situations that they, uh, that, they, that, they, that they find themselves. And so building, building coalitions and building alliances is really hard and it often requires diplomatic, ideological, economic, uh, and security alignment and compromise. And this is where the challenge really gets in with us. So, you know, I think this has been a challenge for the Gulf countries, for the GCC countries. Um, you know, we have seen some examples recently where that has been the case. I think if you look at the intervention in Yemen uh, that took place there, uh, while there seemed to have been a little bit of alignment uh, and, uh, and coordination in the early phases of it, uh, 
uh, a lot of that came apart uh, from a security standpoint, certainly from a political standpoint, uh, and it's uh, you know it's moved into this uh, into this kind of quagmire state here that is not that has not been good for any, for the GCC countries that are involved. Any of the countries it certainly has not been good for uh, for the people of Yemen, and it's continued to be this festering wound on the uh, on the Arabian Peninsula here that has to be done again. Look at something like the Qatar Rift, uh, for example, the the fallout between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, uh, the Emirates. Um, uh, Bahrain, Egypt. Um, this is again another example where you know these this this came at a time when we were trying to build unity against Iran. Um, so it is very it is difficult to do this, and and we don't have a great track record uh, with the Gulf Gulf Cooperation uh, Council countries at this particular point. It's not that there hasn't been some achievements, or there perhaps has been on the maybe on the economic side and some other things uh, that have been done, but it has certainly not risen to the level that we would we would certainly uh, look for. Um, you know, I, I think the way to approach this is to is to begin to build small on this uh, and, and and try to try to build build create building blocks upon which you can uh, create more reliance and more trust and more uh, opportunities for interoperability. So, you know, I, I think looking at it functionally, and I'll just say from a security standpoint here, looking at this functionally is a, is a, is a way to approach this. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's common interests because of Iran with the Gulf countries being able to protect themselves. And so, they're, they're, you know, looking at air defense, for example, uh, and they're in a network in which they can protect themselves. That is, a, that is an area to build upon. Uh, I think if you look at uh, things like maritime security, all of these countries uh, are dependent upon the waterways, uh, yet not, um, not many of them have well-developed uh, navies or maritime security forces uh, uh, that can protect everything that they, that they require. Building, building some interoperability and reliance in that particular area is another area. Cyber is a third area. Uh, all of them are potentially vulnerable, like we are, to cyber attacks. Uh, this could be an area where everybody agrees that uh, that this is a this is a common challenge and 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 beginning to move forward in a more functional manner here uh, to address this. And finally, counter combating terrorism is a is a way of doing this, and and so I think there are some building blocks that we can uh, we can begin to move forward with uh, the the. The Gulf countries don't have a long tradition of this level of collaboration and cooperation that we have enjoyed with, a, for example, with our NATO partners or in some other particular areas. Um, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to uh, to pursue this. And I think it has to be a start small and build and build up approach here as we as we address this. And how do you think? Um this uh, division, does it, does it affect any of our strategic interests with regards to al Udaid base? I'm sorry, with regard to what? The al Udaid base in uh, Qatar, the, the US base in Qatar. Well, I think so far it has not had an impact, but the reason that uh, it has not had an impact is because uh, uh, we have worked very hard to uh, to ensure that it didn't have an impact. Um, you know, there was in the early days of the Qatar Rift, for example, there were impacts on air travel and, uh, and other things there that we identified very quickly and addressed with the, with the relevant partners and made it very clear that this was an unacceptable approach to us, uh, and uh, we would not allow that. Um, when uh, when we saw some efforts to exclude, um, you know, Qatar from broader exercises and things like that in the region, again, the United States uh, made it very very clear that 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 we would not support that, and that they would have to get over this aspect of it. So, you know, I, I think for the most part, it has not had a big impact on us. I think certainly uh, better alignment, better interoperability, better cooperation between all of the uh, 
all of the GCC countries, particularly on security matters, I think would have a positive impact. It would give us the ability to be more flexible, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, be you know use more economy of uh, force uh, with uh, with our logistics, with our force presence, with our capabilities. We, I think it would I think it would have a, a potentially uh, benef more beneficial approach. But right now, I think we have done a good job of of preserving uh, preserving our ability to operate in the, in the region. A, a hot button issue in the Gulf that everyone discusses, whether it be here in the US or um, in, the, in the Gulf region, the GCC or Iran or, or Iraq is uh, Iran actually. And uh, a few days ago, uh, the, uh, the arms embargo on Iran ended and the US uh, struggled uh, in its effort to extend it uh, through the UN Security Council. With Iran uh, free to buy and sell arms, how will this affect uh, the strategic situation in the Gulf? Well, um, yeah, I, th I think, I think it, it affects it in a couple of different ways. Uh, First and foremost, I think it it makes it harder now to to build consensus. The fact that that we are unable to rally uh, a number of countries who are aligned with us to to extend this uh, this this prohibition and the fact that it is in place here, I think makes it makes it more difficult uh, in the future to uh, to create consensus against malign Iranian activity in the in the area. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think the the observation from my standpoint is that uh, we can go this alone, but it's always better in my view, particularly in, our, in an area like the Middle East to go with partners, uh, that with partnership comes added strength, comes consensus, comes the ability to really enforce things uh, uh, that are in our interest, in our common interest as we move forward. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I do fear that we are, we are losing the ability to create more consensus about that. I think, I think this has the potential to raise tensions in the region uh, and and could in some degrees fuel an arms race, for example. You know, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, is that I paid a lot of attention to over the course of my career, particularly the later part of my career when I was a commander and had troops obviously operating in this area and a long term basis was the increased uh, uh, capabilities of Iran, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And you look at their missile cap rocket missile capabilities, their air defense capabilities, these became very, very sophisticated. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and Iran was actually able to pursue that even at a time when there were fairly severe uh, sanctions and restrictions on them in terms of uh, getting arms and, and they were able to do that. Uh, I think we have to ask ourselves what happens now uh, when they now would have more of ability to that and what is the impact on that 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 will create a uh, a fear in on the other side of the gulf that they will need to uh they will need to reciprocate in kind and so you know i think it could lead to a to a to an arms race and a you know a build up in in more tension in this in this very very small but important region okay we have many um uh, questions trickling in. So I know we're running close on time. So let me go ahead and start posing some of them to you. And um, these are from the audience. Um, previous sessions have mentioned a concern that the UAE and Saudi Arabia can inadvertently push Iran and Turkey into an alliance. Do you think this is a realistic concern? And is this something that the US can really prevent? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think it, I think it all, I think we always should be concerned about uh, about alignments uh, between different countries that impact our that impact our our interests, whether that is you know Turkey and Iran or whether it's uh, Russia and China uh, cooperating and acting together in this particular region. So I, I think this is something we should be. Uh, we should be concerned about, frankly. Um, uh, you know, I, the, the, the relationship between the United States and, and Turkey, I think, is a very important one. Uh, there, there will need to be more work done on this. Um, 
There certainly has been a lot of tension uh, infused into the relation, a lot of it by me, frankly, as the CENTCOM commander, uh, as we had to make the use of our of Syrian Kurds on the ground, which which came uh, as, a, as an affront to Turkey. So we do have to, you know, have serious discussions uh, in terms of this. And, and I do think that this could uh, this could fuel more tensions in the region and, and begin lining things up. We have always enjoyed the advantage of having more people lined up with us than, uh, than our adversaries have. Um, and uh, I, say, I think when you begin to see that balance out a little bit more, uh, I think that, is a, that is, a, is, a, is a warning here for, uh, for kind of the strategic outlook of going forward. Okay, on to a, another question. Um, there has been, uh, and I'm reading this uh, from, from the audience, there has been a great improvement of the Iraqi armed forces capabilities in combating ISIS, as you mentioned, um, and they say thanks uh, to US training, of course, but what is the current inf infiltration level of Iranian militias into the Iraqi arm army? And how does the US ensure that the US made weapons do not end up in the hands of these militias yeah uh, i think that's a that's a very very good question and i'm afraid i don't i don't have a uh, i don't have a, a really informed uh answer to give you in terms of a percentage or, or things like that what i guess i can say is that uh you know the the uh, the iraqi you know the iraqi military should be um should like the American military should be representative representative of the society that it's that it serves, um, and it, and at one time it was, uh, and it and it should be it, that should be an objective going forward. Uh, but it, you know, much like we look at in the American military, uh, are the allegiance of the members of that force has to be back to back to the country and to the people they served and you know, to their own form of constitution uh, that they serve in. And this I think is, uh, will continue to be a challenge. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, because of some of the things we've already talked about, because of politicalization, because of the political use of the military, because of internal corruption uh, that took place uh, you know, in the, after the after United States and coalition partners departed in uh, in in 2011, uh, we saw a situation where it where it came apart, and and all of this level of integration and cooperation went went uh, by the wayside. So you know there there has to be a role for uh, Shias in the in the Iraqi army. There has to be a role for Kurds in the Iraqi army. There has to be a role for Sunnis in the Iraqi army. That's what the Iraqi people look like, and that's what their military should, uh, in my view, should look like as well. So there has to be an accommodation. That will not be done quickly. It will take time to do it, but they, where they has to, we have to look at the, at the, at the, uh, you know, the diversity aspect of the, of the Iraqi army and make sure that it is representative of the, of the people and that, that they understand that that's where their, that's where their loyalties lie. And to that extent, external actors who are influencing uh, militias on the ground uh, uh, should cease their activity. There was a need for some of that during the fight against ISIS. That's gone away now. The Iraqi army is, in, is capable of handling the situation. So we, those militias need to be transitioned to something else, either to Iraqi military forces or they need to, be, they need to go away. <clears throat> One uh, country we didn't talk to uh, talk about, I guess, directly is is Yemen. Um, the, so I, I have a two pronged question uh, for you. First, uh, Biden has uh, stated that he will withdraw U.S. support from Yemen. What would that look like, in your opinion? And uh, second, um, does the competition uh, uh, for naval naval facilities? This comes from the audience in the Bab al Mandeb uh, between China, UAE, and other countries concern uh, US strategic interests? Um, sure. So uh, again, really excellent question here. So I, yeah, I know it's it's it seems popular to say we're going to withdraw our, a lot of our support for what's in Yemen, but there we actually have done that already. Um, you know, we have uh, severely 
uh, limited uh, uh, sales of arms to the combatants there. Uh, there are much uh, more stringent and stricter control measures that are put in place. We uh, are not are no longer providing fuel to uh, Arab coalition jets that fly down in that particular area. Uh, so we actually and we, and we we don't have troops on the ground that are that are actually engaged in any of the civil uh, civil uh, civil uh, war act, you know, that is going on between Houthis and and uh, in the Arab in the Arab uh, led coalition, Iranian backed Houthis in the in the Arab led coalition and Yemeni uh, Yemeni forces on the ground. So we there. I'm not I'm not sure what more we can do. That we we do have some interests here uh, with respect to terrorism. Um, it's we should not lose sight of the fact that uh, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, while beat down pretty bad still does exist and still does harbor a threat and so we have to we have to uh, we have to continue to watch after those particular things and it's better in my mind to address them there than it is to address them on our own uh, uh, in our own shoreline here uh, so we have to do that and, and in my regard I that, that I think the amount of resources that we have dedicated to that is is um, is probably sufficient for what we need to do right now and it is a relatively uh, relatively uh, minimal amount of, uh, of support. So I'm not sure that uh, there's a whole lot more that we can do to, uh, to address that. Um, frankly, uh, we, we, sh we certainly should be supporting the UN Special Envoy in his work to try to bring this to a conclusion. And the Bab al-Mendeb, uh, I think this is a, you know, this is a primary interest for us, the, the waterways of the, of the region right here. And, uh, uh, you know, I think the competition between partners, uh, between not partners, between different actors or states in this particular area that could impact uh, the free flow of, uh, of uh, global commerce, um, I, I think is, uh, uh, I think that is something we should, we should be concerned about. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> we have got to always enforce this as we, as we move through and we, and we do, and many Western countries do in this particular area. So I am concerned about some of this competition that plays out in this particular area. I don't know that it has actually impacted anything uh, beyond some of what we've seen from the Iranian-backed Houthis here uh, yet, but it could, and I think it's something we should we should certainly keep our eye on. Thank you, uh, General. Uh, I'm afraid we are we are out of time, and I know it's uh, time and uh, time is very important in the military. So I'm not going to keep you much longer. Um, but I truly appreciate your insights on the U.S. presence in the Gulf region. Um, it, it, your perspectives were thought provoking and we hope uh, whether, what, whichever administration wins, we hope to, that US interests are served and also uh, regional partner interests are served as well. Um, do you have any last uh, points you would like to say? To our audience. No, uh, thanks, Daniel. I, I, I really appreciated the discussion. I always enjoy talking about this area. I haven't served here for a long time. I have great uh, affection and respect for the people uh, of this region and the partners that I've gotten to know over a long period of time. And, uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, most importantly here is the people of this region deserve an opportunity, I think, to to live in peace and stability, and uh, and uh, and and we should always be striving to uh, to to help create that uh, create that situation for them. Uh, it's in our interest, frankly, it's in our American interest for that for this region to be more stable um, and to be more represented and be more resilient on its own. And uh, and we should always be striving for that. But I but I I, I send my greetings to all of my friends in the in the Middle East and particularly in the Gulf and, uh, and wish you all well and look forward to an opportunity to visit and see you all again very soon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, General Goto. So uh, this ends our week long conference, which uh, has been very long because of uh, the non-traditional way in which we had to present the conference given uh, the pandemic. Uh, we thank all of our guests and distinguished speakers for their insights, uh, including uh, General Volto. And we look forward to engaging everyone virtually and hopefully sometime soon in person. Thank you very much, uh, General.